welcome to this episode of the Smart Leader Self Podcast. I'm Jessica Lorimer, sales coach and leadership expert. And today we've got a kind of interesting, I mean, I hope every episode is interesting, but we've got an interesting episode based on a couple of questions that came into my inbox this week and that I've been seeing come up, up a lot online. It was really interesting a few weeks ago, obviously we ran the challenge, the sales in for summer challenge in my free Facebook community, Smart Leader Sales Society. And this is a question that came up fairly regularly in there because obviously when you're encouraging people to make more sales, naturally questions come up around what they should be selling. And so this week it was really interesting to see in my inbox that people had asked questions about being an expert what it really means to be an expert, how qualified you have to be to be an expert, but also this key question of what happens if I'm an expert in a non-money-making niche? So as in, what happens if I'm an expert in an area that doesn't promise money as being the main transformation for my clients? You know, And can I make money out of selling in a non-money-making niche or out of selling results that do not focus on making money. And I think the two naturally tie together, you know, the the two topics tie together because I have so many people who come to me and they say, you know, I'm a health coach and people don't like investing in their health or I'm a relationship coach and people don't want to invest in relationships. I have people who are product based who come to me and say, you know, obviously I'm selling products and they're, they're lower ticket and that makes it more difficult to scale. And so I wanted to bust a few of the myths on this episode, but also give you some insight into what you can be doing. So if you are somebody who is in a a niche that you think, oh, well, the online space, nobody really cares about this, or, you know, it would be so much easier to just be a business coach. I want to kind of dispel some of those myths and give you some ideas and, and strategies around what you could be doing differently, how you can be communicating with your audience differently so that they actually start to listen to what you're saying and are aware of the importance of what you do and and what you're going to bring to their life. So I think the key example to start with here is that recently I ran a competition in my free group and I wanted people to pitch me stuff. And I gave a really clear outline for a brief. So I was like, I'm going to spend $150 on one thing and I want you to pitch it to me and it has to be something that you think I need. Now, obviously, money making is not something I need. I don't necessarily need to be taught how to make money. So I was really looking forward to this because I was thinking this is a prime opportunity for a bunch of people who don't work in money making niches to approach me and be like, I think you need this. And it was really interesting, actually, to see some of the things that were pitched. The most interesting thing was, so my group is traditionally a no promo group, so we don't allow promotion in there because it's a place for discussion, it's a place for asking questions, support, that kind of thing. The most interesting thing for me was that it took an awful long time to get going. So we had, you know, the brave first person went and they pitched. And then, you know, about an hour later, somebody else pitched. And it kind of, it was slow. And there were a lot fewer people pitching than I expected. And when we did the wrap up from this, I asked people, you know, why didn't you pitch? And the common answer was, oh, I didn't think that you meant me. Right? I didn't think you needed my thing or I wasn't sure how to pitch it. And so one of the places I want to start today around expertise and around selling something, regardless of whether money making niche or not, is you are responsible for your actions. You are responsible for seizing opportunities. So even if you don't necessarily think that person will buy my thing, pitch practice is a great idea. You know, especially if you don't think that's what I think, because then you're just getting feedback, right? <laughs> you're just putting it out there in front of other people who may want the thing, okay? So it's, it's important to always seize every opportunity. And that's one thing that experts do really well. And I noticed this recently. So recently on the podcast, we've been doing a few different things. And as you've noticed, we've gone from having on-air live coaching sessions, which were super, super popular, and we will be bringing those back. So please, please, if you are looking for any help or assistance, make sure that you email me and you can hop on for one of those coaching sessions. We've also had the case study transformation episode. So we've brought to you some of the people who've been 
really open and honest about what it's like working with me and what results they've had. But most importantly, talking about their journey and talking about the breakthrough moments and the things that have gone really well and the things that were absolutely horrendous to go through, but necessary for overcoming the journey. And then we started a slightly different series that is about to come out and and you're going to start hearing these episodes in your earbuds shortly around true experts and how they use sales and how sales skills and strategies have been important to their businesses and the different kinds of things that they've done or experienced. And for me, it's really interesting because obviously I've been sat here kind of chilling, (laughs) recording these interviews, having really, really interesting conversations, talking about different sales styles, you know, what works, what doesn't, different industries. And I was really, really fortunate to have conversations with, in particular, two awesome people. So one was Tony Harmer and the other was Sarah J. Coleman. So if you haven't, if you haven't heard about these episodes yet, you've just got a sneak, sneak preview of some of the awesomeness that is to come. And the thing that really struck me about interviewing both Tony and Sarah, and they both did this in incredibly different ways. When you hear their interviews, you will absolutely see the different ways that they seize opportunities on the podcast and it was fantastic you know for me it was really interesting to watch you know and they they seized every opportunity that they could in a really non sleazy way I want to put this I want to make this uh, very very clear in an absolutely non sleazy way they referenced their work they referenced social media accounts they referenced what they were doing and they were really really clever about identifying natural opportunities in the episodes to help my audience and help you guys look at what you could be doing differently in their business areas. You know, and Sarah is in an on money making niche, so that will be a particularly interesting episode for those of you who are in non money making niches. But for me, the, the thing that stood out and that has stood out about recording these expert series is that they are quite happy to identify natural opportunities and to use those opportunities. And I think that that comes with confidence. So let's let's talk a little bit about what it really means to be an expert, because I think that's quite important to always define something before you start. Otherwise, definitions can be watery and, and people can get quite offended about, you know, am I an expert or not? Well, Jess is saying that a bunch of people who are this aren't, so that's, <laughs> that's always a challenge. But the Oxford Dictionary, because that is my source of all definitions, says that an expert is a person who is very knowledgeable or skilled in a particular area. Now, I think that this is really important, okay, because I often, when I was working in corporate sales, I would tell everyone, and I still do, I still say this, and, and maybe it's something that I should stop saying, but I, I probably never will. I always would say to people, I'm talentless. That's why I ended up in sales. And I I do. I have zero talents in my life. I cannot draw. I cannot, you know, do any kind of art. I I can sing well enough in the shower or karaoke not to embarrass myself. But, you know, I'm not a, a classically trained opera singer or anything. And I always thought about this as I just, I just don't have any talent. So when I read the definition about being an expert, I was like, yeah, well, I'm still a talentless fool. But (laughs) the good thing about being an expert is that nowhere does it mention talent. It mentions a person who is knowledgeable, very knowledgeable, or skilled in a particular area. And for me, whilst I have absolutely zero creative talents, and I'm very, very jealous of anyone that does, I am knowledgeable about sales. And I am incredibly skilled at sales, you know, in terms of all aspects of sales. And I think this is also really important because when we talk about expertise, and certainly when we're selling expertise, I think that we forget it's not about prescription. And I think that this is something that has come from this generation of baby business coaches that everyone's been producing, you know, and and there's like this school of business coaching and then they just produce business coaches and then those business coaches go out and coach other coaches to be business coaches. And for me, that's terrifying because it's so prescriptive and everyone does the same lemon thing 
Bye, everyone. Week one, who's your ideal client? Week two, build your brand. Week three, look at your website. And it's no wonder to me that people who come out of those kinds of courses do not make money. One, it's prescriptive and dull and you don't develop your own style of voice. Two, sales. It's always like the last week of the course. I think everyone's like, I'm going to teach you sales, but it's not going to be until week 10 of a 12-week course. Are you kidding? <laughs> I have to wait 10 weeks before I can even learn about sales. That only gives me two weeks to practice before the end of the course is over and your support is gone. And then I'm away. You know, it's kind of terrifying to me. This idea of expertise is about being very knowledgeable or very skilled at something. And yet, collectively, this online space over the last three years has really designed this prescriptive formula to everything. And what that means is that we produce generations of, of coaches or consultants who think they're coaches and consultants, but who actually struggle to deliver to clients because everything should be prescriptive and, and they're assuming that their client should just get it. They should just know who their ideal client is because they took the 46 page questionnaire. But when they don't, suddenly they have to troubleshoot. And that's really difficult, right? Because if you're not a web developer, but you've told somebody that week three's module is all about web design, and they come to you and say, hey, my insert plugin name here isn't working, what do you do? Oh, okay, sorry. Try YouTube to fix it. Right? That doesn't work. It doesn't work for people. And then what happens is your clients don't get the results that they want. Because honestly, and, and maybe this is a little bit woo, but you're not operating from your expertise and so it's not your fault right it, it's not it's not the fault of the baby business coaches and i do refer to them as that and I, i'm sorry if that's insulting but i i think that there is a spate of it you know it's not their fault that they can't troubleshoot but really building a business and being that expert and selling that expertise is about not only being able to sell it and and being able to show people or explain to people how you can help them, but also demonstrate that consistently and help your clients get the results that they actually want. And so for me, you know, expertise, when we look at, you know, how do I know if I'm an expert? Because let's be honest, I don't think anyone has ever felt like an expert. I certainly don't call myself an expert. Other people do, and, and it makes me feel very uncomfortable. Because <laughs> it makes me feel like I'm about 65 and that I should know loads more than I do. And don't get me wrong, you know, in, in terms of knowing about sales, I do know an awful lot. I've got 12 years of experience, but there are people out there with 20 years. There are people out there with 30 years. So how can I be an expert? And that's the question that I think we all pose to ourselves fairly regularly. And that's where, you know, self doubt can creep in. So when we're thinking about, okay, are we an expert? I always tell people, look, you've got to look at what it means to be knowledgeable or skillful. Okay, so if you're saying I am a marketing expert, then I expect you to be knowledgeable about things that fall under that marketing category. I expect you to be knowledgeable about communication channels. I expect you to be knowledgeable about social media platforms. I expect you to be skillful in terms of creating a blue sky strategy that can work for my business. And I expect you to be able to troubleshoot things like, why are we not getting more leads for the cost that we're paying? I expect that because if you tell me that you're a marketing expert, then I expect you to know all of those things because marketing is a very broad term. And I think that, you know, sometimes when it comes to being an expert, it's actually easier to specialize in one area first. So for example, instead of being a marketing expert, you could say I'm a social media expert. You could say I'm a Facebook ads expert. You can say I'm an Instagram expert. And I've got some very, very successful clients that do those things and they do them really well and they are successful and they build a huge name for themselves because they focus. Equally, I've got some really successful clients that have broader scope and capability in their titles. You know, so I do have amazing mindset experts who focus not just on you know, one aspect of mindset who don't focus specifically on something like trauma or, you know, anything like that, but they focus on mindset as a broad connective space, you know. And I think that you know, it doesn't matter where you want to focus. It matters that you pick the scope that is right for you right now. The other thing I think is really important to look at when you're looking at whether you're knowledgeable and skillful is, you know, 
where have you put your reps in? And this is something that Heather Gray, one of my biz besties, always talks about. And it's, it's something that has always stuck with me is that a lot of people come into the online space and are being taught, oh, yeah, you can just be a business coach. And, and everyone's like, oh, cool. What experience do you have in business? And the answer, overwhelmingly and terrifyingly, just genuinely terrifyingly, is nothing. Oh, I've never, I've never had a business before. Or I've never had a successful business before. Or I've never worked in a business before. Literally, you're, you're getting people who are saying, oh, yeah, I, I basically, I, I'm just kind of, you know, rocked up after my gap year. And um, now I'm a business coach. And I'm like, oh. Was your degree business related? No. Okay. Have you, have you ever worked in a business? No. People who haven't even worked in a Starbucks, right? Starbucks is like one of the world's biggest businesses. And yet people who haven't worked in one will openly say, oh, no, no, but I'm a business coach. I'm going to tell you how to make six figures. Right. But if you've never worked in a business that has made six figures or you have never done it, how are you going to troubleshoot these issues? How are you knowledgeable about this? Just because you read the e myth once, it doesn't mean that automatically you downloaded all this information into your brain. You know, for me, that that is one of the things that I consider expertise. Expertise is about putting those reps in. Where did you demonstrate these skills? Where did you learn these skills? And that's important to me. You know, in the online education space, this is an unregulated industry, and, and that's also a very challenging workplace to be in. It's, it's a very challenging environment. One of the things I loved about working in corporate was that when I was working for a big brand, you know, in a regulated industry, I could say, well, we meet all of these regulations. We meet all of these financial regulations. We meet all of this, these HR professional development regulations or CSR regulations, all this kind of stuff. We would, we would meet those and exceed them and we could use that as a selling point. And working in an unregulated industry is really hard because you can't be like, oh yeah, sure, well, you know, I uh, I sat there and I read 20 personal development books, so hire me. That, that doesn't work. And I think we have to look at, sometimes it's not about the reps that you put in in the online space. Like, don't get me wrong here. I think a lot of people come into the online space who've had super, super successful corporate careers um, or who have built up businesses previously or who have had experience, you know, personally in certain areas that has led them to become an expert. However, they've put their reps in, they've read the books, they've got the certifications, they've demonstrated expertise, they've been able to troubleshoot, they've gained skills, they've learned knowledge. These things are really, really important. And, you know, I, I get a lot of clients who come to me and they walk away from corporate jobs and they say, I don't want to use any of those skills ever again. And I think, well, that's such a shame because in those skills, you have something that is immediately and eminently marketable and sellable. And I think it's some of the best businesses that I see, some of the most successful clients I see are people who have built businesses not based on what they did in their corporate career. Don't get me wrong. If you were an accountant and you want to go into being a, a hypnotherapist, that's totally fine. But they're utilizing the skills that they learn in corporate. All right. They're, they're utilizing their ability to set themselves key performance indicators. They're using the time management skills that they learnt from years of working in a structured environment. And that is really, really important. And I think the other thing about being an expert is that the majority of experts will tell you we don't really know anything. Experts are great at being experts because we have this kind of thirst for more knowledge. I always want to be better. If I'm the expert now, that's cool. But there's still so much that I want to learn. And I spend the majority of my time learning things because I really like learning things. I am that sad person who just can't get enough. I have thousands and thousands of sales books that I've read, things that I've listened to, courses that I've been on. I've learned from some of the best salespeople in the world. Jordan Belfort, you know, the original Wolf of Wall Street was somebody that I learned from way back when. You know, I had corporate trainers. I had different kinds of consultants that would come into businesses that I was working for who had so much more knowledge than I did. And I soaked it up like a little sponge and was like, right, oh my God, sales is amazing. And 
you know, then I broadened out into a psychology piece and, and got to understand, okay, well, psychologically, why do humans do what we do? How do we interact? Why is sales so important? You know, what is this persuasion thing? How do we do it? Why do kids do it so naturally? And there were all these questions, and there still are tons of questions that I have that I want answered. And so I read voraciously. I listen to things. I take courses. It doesn't make me less of an expert because I always want to hone my craft. And I think that's something that we don't see. And it's funny because I was talking to one of my friends the other day and we were talking about testimonials. And testimonials can be really difficult actually to get when you're working with people at a certain level. So if you're working with super successful business owners, actually sometimes it can be really difficult to get a testimonial because they never want to admit that they had help. And my friend was saying to me, you know, why is it that you always give testimonials? And I said, because I really appreciate the work that people put in. And anyone who thinks that I built my business entirely alone, just sat in my office, is daft. Really, really daft. Because to be an expert, you have to, in my eyes, you have to demonstrate this, this very knowledgeable piece, this very skillful piece, but also this willingness to adapt, to change, to learn, to grow. And so hiring other people who are experts in different fields makes a huge difference, right? So when we give testimonials, we're actively saying, hey, I am somebody who clearly invested in getting and learning these skills to put to good use in my business. You're not saying, hey, I learned these skills because I want to go out and sell them because that's, that's not it. You know, over the years, the, the kind of people that I've hired have been around mindset, have been around learning social media platforms, have been around hiring people to do things in my business, to graphics, web design, like loads and loads of different things that I know nothing about. I don't sell those things, but I hire experts. I hire other people who can bring that knowledge base, who can bring that skill base. And then, of course, I give them a testimonial because I just learn a ton of stuff or I just had a ton of results that I wouldn't have otherwise gotten. So make it really, really clear when you're thinking about how am I an expert, you know, think about this. Where have you put your, your reps in? Have you put them in in a professional environment? Or did you learn these things on a personal basis? Some of the best clients that I know have worked or have ended up working in environments because of something they experienced personally. You know, people who've got kids have gone on to be great parenting coaches or sleep coaches or, you know, in, in specific areas like working with special needs children and things like that. Those are things that maybe they didn't learn that in a professional environment because they didn't think that that's where their career was going to go. But once life changed for them, they were able to go out and consume this knowledge voraciously to put these things into practice in their own personal environment with their own children and make things work so that they could go out and support and help others. You know, they, they've learned those skills that we talked about earlier that are so important. They can troubleshoot. You know, they don't just have a prescriptive formula that if it doesn't work, then you're screwed. They are able to troubleshoot. They're able to guide you through different processes. You know, so when you're thinking about this expertise, don't worry if it's not something you learn working for, uh, insert massive consultancy name here. It's about are you somebody who has put the reps in? Are you somebody who's genuinely learned a skill or who has knowledge around a specific area? Are you somebody who is voraciously or committed to voraciously learning more about that particular skill? You know, can you troubleshoot things? Or are you just simply regurgitating things that you've learned out of books or from other professionals? And then we come on to this question around non-money-making niches. And I really love this because this is a question I get a lot. Of people say to me, Jess, it would be so much easier if I sold sales. And I'm like, oh, really, it wouldn't. <laughs> and the reason that it wouldn't is because when you sell anything, you have to, you have to sell something that you have demonstrated you can get results with. And so it's funny because I know a lot of people who sell, let, let's just put this into a basic example, right? I know a lot of people out there who sell one thing. So they'll sell, let's say, I don't know, mindset. Right? They'll sell mindset. They'll be like, okay, I'm a mindset coach. And then their messaging will go, yeah, yeah, I'm a mindset coach and I'm going to help you make seven figures. And I'm like, hmm, okay. For me, this is a challenge. Now, if you're a mindset coach listening, please don't get your hackles up, right? I'm perfectly aware and I'm being devil's advocate here and picking the, the easiest example that springs to mind. But I know that there are certainly mindset coaches out there who can help people work things like 
work through things, sorry, like confidence issues or money mindset issues, investment issues that actually can go on to help them make more money because as a result of becoming more confident, perhaps they go out and sell more. You know, they, they make their offers more. As a result of looking at their money blocks and, and things that are stopping them investing, they actually go on to invest in things in their business that can help them make money. However, I don't believe that every single area has to lead to the outcome of sales to be successful. I'm going to walk through some, some clients of mine today who don't sell sales, who don't sell money making, that are successful and that are well known in their industries and, and well known for being experts because they are confident enough to stick to their niche. So when we talk about this, this non-money making results piece, let's look at some big companies that don't sell money making. So you believe me, because I know that it's really easy to be like, well, Jess, it's easy to sell say because you sell sales and everyone wants to make money. But trust me, selling sales can be challenging, can have its own challenges because you have to ensure that people get results. It's very results based. If people don't get results, then you're not going to get more clients, right? You're only as good as your last client. Whereas if you are selling, I don't know, a product, if you're selling mugs, people just have to like the mug when it gets to them. Right? So if they like the mug, they're going to buy more mugs. It's, it's very, very different. Every space, and I've, I've worked in a lot of different industries and I've sold in a lot of different industries, everything from financial services to public sector, not for profit, to retail, to all of the things. And I can tell you that every single space has its own challenges, but every single expert in any space will tell you there is money to be made with anything about opportunity it's about really identifying those opportunities taking them you know and, and making it work so let's talk about some big companies right apple i always mention apple on the podcast maybe like one day i'm going to write to them and be like i have recorded a, a bunch of episodes and i use you guys as a as a kind of yardstick regularly but apple don't sell money making okay they just don't they sell innovation they sell the image of you being a hipster and changing the world and drinking out of mason jars and being really cool, working from coffee shops on slick laptops. They sell this image of yourself, right? They sell innovation. They sell change. That's what Apple sell. And if you distill that down even further, they sell phones and laptops. And that's it, right? They're not selling. If you buy this phone, you will be able to run your business from it and make more money. That is not on an Apple sales pitch, right? They're not selling. If you use this laptop, you'll be able to work 50 times faster because it won't break down, like insert brand competitor name here, and you'll be able to make more money. They're not doing that, right? Because they don't need to, because that is not their niche. That's not what their ideal client or customer needs. And Apple are really smart because they've thought about this. What does their ideal client actually want to feel what is the problem that they're solving. And the problem they're solving is, you know, like me, they want to have 50 tabs open, they want to look cool, they want to have this image of themselves working location free and being innovative. And they've solved that with slick technology that looks good, that's Instagrammable, right? Let's look at Starbucks. I talked about Starbucks earlier, and, and to be fair, recently they've had a bit of a rough run of it. I actually really like Starbucks as a company. I think that they've done some great things over the years including, and I, I want to kind of throw this one out there, including things like great staff development and, you know, putting in place really solid learning strategies for their staff. They've produced some great baristas, for example, which is a niche in and of itself. And in fact, I was looking this up before I started recording. The world has like barista championships and you can literally make a ton of money from being a really good barista and making art that goes on coffee. That is non-money making. It's beautiful, but it's a non-money making niche, right? But these people are making money out of it. They are super successful. They are experts because they're able to, and I don't even know how they do it, but they're able to put milk and coffee together in ways that make patterns and shapes and it just looks awesome. It's impressive, right? But if we look at Starbucks as a company, Starbucks is not selling you coffee to help you make more money, right? They're not saying to you, hey, buy our triple espresso because when you buy a triple espresso, your brain is going to be firing 
at the speed of light, you are going to be so, so productive. Your heart rate is going to be up and you are going to make a ton of money. That's not what they're saying, right? Starbucks, again, like Apple, they've looked at their ideal customer and they're going, okay, what does our ideal customer want? Well, in the morning, they want a coffee that tastes really good, that comes from, that is ethically sourced, that comes from somewhere, you know, that, that is providing for the workers, that tastes great and that gets them fired up for whatever it is that they're off to do. And so that's what they've done. They've gone out, they've sourced coffee beans from all over the world. They've put in place ethical um, farming procedures. You know, they look after their workers. And when you go into Starbucks and you buy a cup of coffee, you know it's going to taste the same wherever in the world you are. It's great. It's not going to help you make more money. They don't do it for that, right? And this is the thing. I think sometimes when we're in this online education space, everyone wants to go back to, oh my God, I can teach you to make money because we think that that is what everyone wants. And indeed, if you're hanging out in a bunch of build your business groups because you are trying to build your business, then yes, everyone in there will want to make money because guess what? They set up a business, right? Businesses need money. Businesses need marketing. But just because you're hanging out in those groups doesn't mean you have to sell to those people. So if you're an artist, and you join a bunch of business building groups because you want to get your prints on Etsy or you want to, you know, pitch to key or major like retailers of art or you want to host your own gallery event or anything like that. It doesn't mean that you, you need to be selling your art and saying, yes, well, if you buy this painting, you can hang it on your wall and it's got loads of dollar signs on it. So when you look at it, you're automatically thinking about making money and subliminally you're getting this messaging that tells you to make money and and therefore you're going to be a millionaire. That's not why people buy art. I buy art because I like it. You know, it means that we have some hideous paintings (laughs) because I'm very eclectic about art. But I buy it because I think, ah, that makes me happy. Or that makes me feel a certain emotion. I like that. I want to look at it regularly. That's why I buy art. You know, and I think, This is the kind of wider conversation that we need to be having around selling. We need to, when we're looking at what we're selling, when we're looking at these non-money-making niches, we're actually looking at, okay, what are we seeing most often? And I see this a lot, you know, and I've, I've touched upon it here with the business group thing, but I see a lot of business owners, they start out and they start out in something really interesting. I, I, I always used to see people who would start out as health coaches or doulas or photographers or relationship coaches and it was great and the things that they did were so interesting and then they'd work with a business coach and they'd be in like a a business coaching group and suddenly the message would shift and it would be like okay well I'm going to teach you how to build a business or I'm going to teach you how to be a great marketer or I'm going to teach you this and I'd be like oh but you were really passionate about health coaching you're really passionate about relationships you're really passionate about you know helping women have easy births or, or whatever and then suddenly they change. And I couldn't really work it out. And it was only, it, it did take me a while. And I'm going to obviously say I'm clearly not that bright because I, I didn't realize that this was a thing. But it got to the point where a lot of these people would come and work with me afterwards because they hadn't been successful as business coaches. And they'd say, oh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's really hard and I'm struggling and I'm really trying, but I just can't make it work. And, and I'd say, oh, well, do you actually enjoy it? And they'd be like, oh, no. No, my clients don't get results, or I find it really difficult, or I find it really difficult to get clients. And when I do get a client, I'm like really stressed because I need another client, blah, blah, blah. And we'd always end up taking them back to their original passion. They'd always end up going back to being a hypnotherapist, or, you know, they go back to being the, the fitness person, or they go back to being whatever it was that they'd originally started as, whatever their passion project was. And they'd end up making more money, and they'd be like, well, how does this work? I'm not even selling making money now. I say, well, it's because you like this. It's much easier to sell something that you like and that you know you're good at than something that you don't. You know, and I think that's the danger sometimes of the online spaces. We think, oh, everyone wants to make money because we are surrounding ourselves. When we're business people and we're looking to learn about business, we are therefore surrounding ourselves with other people who they do only want to learn business skills, but they're not your ideal client right? And you have to identify where you are spending your time and identify the differences in the places that you're spending your time for your own support and learning and the places that you are using to identify prospective clients and people that you need in your audience. 
and the two are very different. You know, the, the two are very different, unless you are a business coach or whatever who, who's actually really good at what you do. So I think, you know, money making is when we see it all the time, we think it's something that's really attractive. But what we don't always understand is that people put massive values on other things. So I went out and as, as part of the research that I was doing around sales psychology a few years ago, I looked at what was really important to people. You know, what were the things that were really, really important to people? And there were certain things that just kept coming up. So one was love and relationships. But like everyone on the planet wants a Disney relationship where they're going to live happily ever after. Bluebirds will be singing, massive dresses, weddings, all that kind of stuff. And, and love and relationships are really important to people. And then there was health, right? Health was really important to people because you don't want to die at 29. So that's a big fear for people. People want to be healthy. We want to be able to or we want to physically be able to do all of the things that we want to do for as long as we possibly can. So health was a big thing. Money. Everyone always wants more money. Okay, the, the majority of people, there was actually a study that said that once you're earning like 25 grand a year, actually you don't get any happier. Money doesn't make you any happier. Earning more money doesn't make you any happier. However, it can contribute to different experiences which can make you happy. Travel. The ability to provide different things for your kids. You know, being able to do things that and not worry, not have that kind of financial stress. So money is a big driver for people. Those things were some of the key areas that people were bothered by. Love and relationships, health, money. And so it was, it was, it is fascinating to me because every industry really covers one of those things in some way, shape or form, right? Facebook, one of the biggest businesses on the planet. What does it cover? You might be thinking, oh, money, but it doesn't, right? Facebook's clever because Facebook covers this relationships piece. Facebook's mission is about connecting the world. And that, that right there is how they became so big because they had this mission to connect people, to help people build relationships. Smart, right? Yes, now they make a ton of money, but their, their whole thing, and even now when they're, they're trying, they're clamping down on ads, they're, you know, really trying to verify things. Their big thing is about connection. It's not about advertising revenue. They're not selling, join Facebook, build a business, make a ton of money. No, no, no. They're selling, join Facebook, connect with people who are like you, forge relationships that work for you. Cool. It's very different, right? If we look at Pure Gym, who are an up and coming gym business here in the UK. They're fantastic, right? They're, they're a fascinating company and they've grown rapidly over the last three to five years. And the reason is that they've decided to make health accessible for everyone. They've opened 24 hour gyms and they're low priced, right? You can go into a pure gym and you can have an account for like 18 quid a month, 18 pounds a month, and you can go whenever you want. You can go at two o'clock in the morning if it suits you. You can go at six o'clock at night. You can go at three o'clock in the afternoon. You can go to classes. You can whatever. But they've made it accessible for everyone because health is important, you know. And they recognize that the biggest objections to people getting healthier, oh, well, I don't have time to go to the gym. Oh, the gym's always busy when I'm not, blah, 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 blah. I said, well, okay, well, here you go. It's open all the time. Come when you want. Smart. It's about health. It's not about money making. They're not selling go to the gym and you'll be really fit. And when you're really fit, you'll make more money. That may or may not be true, I've no idea, but they're not selling that because that's not what they do. They're helping people overcome health challenges and stay in the best shape that they can for as long as possible. You know, I think this is where we need to start looking. When we're, when we're looking at what's important when you're building a business, to you, money making may be important, but that doesn't mean that that's what you should sell, right? If you Even if you're seeing tons and tons of people out there and you're thinking, yeah, but I'm in marketing and marketing's like kind of close to sales. For the love of God, don't sell sales if you're a marketer because that's not what marketing's about. Good marketing is about communication. It's about lead generation. It's about all these amazing things that, yes, can help you make more sales. But it's not the overall transformation. If you're selling mindset, don't think, oh, well, you know, someone's only going to buy from me if I talk about being a millionaire or making seven figures or whatever because that's not why people want help with their mindset, people will recognize that they are not as resilient as they want to be or that 
They don't feel the self-worth or self-confidence that they used to. And they'll want people to help them overcome those challenges. They don't need to be sold money. Yeah? Now, I'm talking about this and in my head there's this like, little fear that I'm like, oh shoot, am I talking about, you know, everyone go and, and find a non-money making industry and only sell that? And I, you know, and, and obviously about the, what people will think because I'm talking about this. But the thing is, I'm not doing this episode, I'm not recording this episode just so that you can all stop wanting to be sales coaches or business coaches or, you know, talk about making money in your marketing. Because absolutely, if you are somebody who can help people get a financial result, talk about it. 100%, 100,000,000% 100%, 100,000,000,000% million percent do. Be confident in it. If that's your area of expertise, 100,000 million percent. But for those of you who are selling products, for those of you who are in non-money making niches, who are thinking to themselves, oh God, we're not selling something that's going to make you money. We're selling you something that's going to make your life easier, that will be convenient for you, that will help you know, appeal to one of these core areas, love, relationships, health, wealth. You know, don't worry. There are more than enough clients out there for you, and you don't have to start going around pimping out sexy results like, you know, Stacy lost 12 pounds and made a million dollars because she lost 12 pounds. Right? Don't, don't feel like that has to be your marketing because it doesn't. You know, instead, take ownership of this I am great, I'm an amazing mindset expert, and I can help you overcome challenges. I can help you have strong leadership conversations. I can help you rejuvenate your sense of self-worth and confidence. And yeah, sure, that can lead to more sales. Most importantly, though, you will feel like this. Okay. And when you're in these non-money making niches or money making niches, the key thing is that you are able to describe the outcome and the result of what that person is going to get so clearly that they know it's achievable. So for example, sure, I sell sales. I do, like I I sell in a money-making industry. I am that person. But I don't actually sit there and go, hey, you can make six figures if you work with me. That's not my marketing strategy, never has been. I talk about helping people to overcome objections, helping people grow their confidence when it comes to selling, helping people develop a non-sleazy sales strategy, helping people identify the areas that they're struggling and scale their businesses, automation, funnels. There's nothing in there in my marketing about six figure, seven figure, making all the the money in the world, even for cash creation. You know, cash creation is a program that is designed to help you make money. And so we do, when we market it, we talk about the results that we've had, but very, very clearly, we talk about the things that people want from that program. People want sales to be easy. Okay, here you go, have templates, what could be easier? People want it to be simple. Okay, well, here you go. Have proven strategies with step-by-step processes. How could it be simpler? You know, we look at the outcomes that people want and we market to that. You know, when you're selling in these non-money-making industries or money-making industries, you've got to be very, very clear. What are the results? What are the outcomes that those people want? And if you're in a non-money-making industry, it is really thinking about, okay, what's the outcome that my client wants? If I'm a chiropractor, Do they want to make money? No. Do they want to go home and feel like their back is not in knots and that their neck doesn't hurt anymore and they stop getting those really irritating headaches? Yes, those are your core outcomes. Write those on your marketing, you know, write those in your emails because that's what matters. Yeah. And then finally, I think we have to talk about can we ever switch our niche? If I wasn't British, I'd have been like, can we ever switch our niche? And it would have sounded so much cooler and it would have been ace and just I, I would have loved it for all of those little OTD tendencies I have around how things sound and listening things. But I'm British, so we're gonna go with niche. Yes. Yes we can switch our niche. And I've seen some people who've done it incredibly successfully, and I've seen some people who have taken a little while longer to bed in. And I think that there are a couple of reasons for that. I think one of them is that you actually need to stick to the niche that you have switched to right so i see a lot of people who go oh yeah i was a mindset expert and now i'm a marketing expert for example um <laughs> i'm really not good at, at putting out different kinds of examples at 9 a.m in the morning so forgive me if it feels like i'm just beating up mindset experts or whatever today <laughs> like, i've just got that in my head i've got calls with mindset clients later and that's what i'm going to be doing that. 
but you know, they, they switch from being a mindset expert to a marketing expert because perhaps they, they've built this amazing business, they found all the marketing that really works for them. And so they go ahead and they sell that. But then what happens is they kind of, they don't stick with it. So one month they'll be selling marketing strategies and then they're a little bit concerned because perhaps not as many people are signing up as they'd like. As they go back, they're like, oh, I'm going to do a flash sale on my mindset stuff. And your audience is confused because they're like, well, you do mindset, you do marketing. Like, what? I, I don't know why I'm following you. Help. So you've got to be consistent. If you're going to switch your niche, consistency is key, you know, and it, it's something that needs to happen. So once you have switched, it doesn't mean you can never, ever, ever sell the old thing again, but it does mean that for three to six months, you do have to be consistent around building a new tribe that actually want that stuff because some of the old people will want it, but some of them won't. Some of them will want to move away and that's fine. They need to go and find, you know, expert in whatever it was that you were doing previously. And that's cool. But be aware that when you switch your niche, you have to build a new tribe. You might have some pre-existing, but you you will have to build a new audience and that takes time. Right? You'll obviously be selling to them straight away and so you will be making money, but you might experience an income dip and that is okay. You know, it's normal. It happens. Equally, when you switch your niche, you know, you have to sell what you are now selling. Okay, so for example, we touched on this earlier. Don't sell like, I don't know, don't sell marketing, but really in your, all of your messaging, you're talking about sales because it confuses people and it actually makes it really, really difficult for you to sell your programs because if you're talking about boost by marketing strategy or social media platforms or communications and that kind of thing, but you're actually selling, yeah, this is how you're going to make this much money or whatever, the outcome doesn't match what the client is looking to buy and that becomes a problem. Whereas when you, like a few of my clients does really well, Sam Barefoot is an Instagram expert. And what she does is she says, yeah, I will help you grow your following on Instagram and get you more engagement with your followers so that you can go and get more leads and so that you can be responsible for, for converting them into sales. And that's really smart because the people who follow her they want more followers on Instagram. They want more engagement because they are smart enough to know that if they had more followers, they would be able to get more leads and they would be able to then make more sales. All right? So don't be afraid to say, hey, I'm just going to do this bit and you, <laughs> you, my friend, are responsible for the rest. Okay. It's been a big episode today. I feel like it's been a big episode. I feel like it's been a serious one. I feel like I've been very, very serious. So I am sorry for that because, you know, usually I, I like to have a bit of a giggle when I'm recording these episodes. And today is no different, but I think this is a serious issue. I think it is something that we do need to be talking about. We do need to be highlighting that, you know, it is important to be an expert. It doesn't mean that you can never, ever be an expert in something else. It doesn't mean that you can't switch your niche. It doesn't mean that you can't make money. But when you're an expert, you will make money, you will seize opportunities, and you will do well within any area of specialism, not just a money-making niche. I hope this has been helpful to you. If it has, make sure that you hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss another episode. You can get them all easy peasy into whatever podcasting app that you are using at the current time. If you have enjoyed it or you've got any thoughts on it, I'd love to hear from you. You know, Feel free to send me an email and let me know what you thought, um, whether you agree with me, whether you've got any other questions around it. Because I think it's an important discussion to have and I'm, I'm really excited to open the gates on this one. So have a really, really fabulous week. I will see you on Friday's episode with a super special guest. And I'm very, very excited to introduce them to you. I'll see you soon. 